cross-platform SQL Server Management. Thank you for joining us today for Essential Linux for the DBA, presented by Kellen Gorman. This 24 hours of past event consists of 24 consecutive live webinars delivered by expert speakers from the past community. And of course, these sessions will be recorded and posted online after the event. Emails will be sent uh, when the recordings are available. My name is Andy Yoon. I'm a senior solutions engineer with Century One, who is one of our event sponsors today. And I'm your moderator for this session. I do have a few uh, introductory slides to go over before I do uh, hand over the reins to Kellen. So as you can see with the first slide, if you do require technical assistance, please type your question into the questions pane on the uh, right hand side of your screen and someone will assist you. Also, if you happen to have a question during the course of the session, please also type it into the uh, questions pane there. And then once we get to the Q&A portion, uh, we will field those together. You can also zoom in on the session content if you need to by using the zoom button that's located at the top of your presentation window. And then please note that there will be a short eval at the end of this session. Your feedback is very important to us. So please, please take a moment to complete it. And this will pop up after the webinar ends. Next slide, please. So I want to take a moment to uh, thank our presenting sponsors, Microsoft, Century One, Quest, and Idera, in addition to our supporting sponsor, Redgate. We could not be holding uh, 24 hours of pass without the support, uh, generous support of our sponsors. Uh, and they're the reason that this event is uh, free of charge. If you'd like to learn more about our sponsors, please sign up and sign up for information uh, on how they can help you. Please visit the sponsors page on the uh, 24 hours of pass website. Next slide, please. Pass Summit is the Pass Community's flagship event, and it'll be occurring later this year on November 6th through the 9th in Seattle, Washington. Pass Summit is the largest conference for technical professionals who uh, utilize the Microsoft Data Platform uh, and immerse yourself in deep dive technical sessions, learn best practices, discover new tips and tricks. So for more information and to register for the Pass Summit, please visit PassSummit.com. Next slide, please. Okay, and with that, it is my honor to introduce our main presenter, Kellen Gorman, who is a member of the Oak Table Network and an Oracle ACE Director alumnus. She's the Technical, uh, technical Intelligence Manager at Delphix, a company recognized for its impressive uh, virtualization and data masking environment capabilities. Kellen is also known for her extensive work with multi-database platforms, DevOps, cloud migrations, virtualization, scripting, environment optimization, tuning, automation, and architecture design. Kellen has spoken at many, many different technical conferences for Oracle, Big Data, DevOps, testing, and of course, SQL Server. Next slide, please. All right, actually with that, that completes the preamble. So uh, Kellen, the floor is now yours. And I appreciate everybody joining me today. Uh, I'm a little inundated with multi-platform here. I'm actually in Las Vegas at uh, an Oracle conference, Collaborate, which is kind of the second largest conference in the Oracle gauntlet of events. And I uh, was surprised to find out, oh, 24 Hop is now in, in April. I was thinking it was July. But luckily, I have all those contents. So glad to share it with everybody today. So as we know, SQL Server has come to the world of Linux. And uh, there's a lot to learn, um, you know, and all the folks on the SQL Server side are starting to embrace this, you know, it's, it's kind of challenging. Uh, administrative support that the Oracle folks have had for so long. We had an administrator on site. Server side, they're in the cloud. And when you need assistance, many times you've had to learn it on your own. So hopefully this to start from the beginning and go forward because we all know we need to learn to walk before we run. Kellen, can I interrupt you for a moment? May I suggest that you turn off your webcam because right now we're actually seeing some buffering issues uh, with your broadcast. Does that look better? The next slide. Uh, actually, your audio even cut in and out uh, there for a moment. So, yeah, uh, why don't we just uh, cut off your uh, webcam? That way, that'll free up some more bandwidth. This is a large slide deck, so definitely let me know if there's any issues with it. I am used to giving it in person. 
So let's start with a history lesson here. Um, Lennox started out by... He started out with this back in 1991. It uh, was actually called Freax. He uh, did not want it. Name this after you. And it is based on C programming as part of the new project with Richard Stolman. It's a C library. And there are over at this point 19 million rows of, of code. It uh, comes in a number of flavors. And he you know, desktop, you know, Raspberry Pi's come up with Raspbian in the new, uh, the newbie version, as we call it, which is a flavor of Debian, but there. Kellen, this is Andy again. I apologize for interrupting. Please turn off your webcam to free up some more bandwidth because your audio is actually cutting in and out. Hopefully that will do better. We're going to find out just how good the Wi-Fi is here in the hotel itself. All right. Apologies for that. Andy, do let me know if it gets worse again. Um, so we have a number of Linux uh, 2017 beta came out and was running across. We saw it on Red Hat as well as we saw it a lot of fun with it. And I've been recommending a number of folks to start downloading the Docker images as well as work with Azure. Of course, I've lost control of my slides. There we go. So if you are how to actually log in, um, where you're used to using the remote desktop with Windows with this, most people are going to tell you the Oracle side, Sybase, any of the others you utilize. Uh, and if you're on a Mac, of course, you get the terminal right there that you can You have the ability to log in with the terminal. Are we doing all right, Andy? Uh, Kellen, actually, I was about to jump in. Apologies, but uh, we are still having audio breakup issues. Is there anything else that you can do to optimize your bandwidth right now? I have shut down just about everything. I will close that as well since I got that new link when we were trying to work with this. Let's see if that helps. And apologies, everyone, for the technical get difficulties here. Unfortunately, even right now with your responses to me, uh, there is a periodic break in uh, audio. Really? One second here. Hopefully, I will not lose connectivity. But I may. I was going to switch over and actually toggle from my phone if the Wi-Fi is that bad right now. And in the meantime, everyone else, thank you again for your patience. We're doing our best to work through this, so appreciate uh, your patience. Welcome back. Wonderful. 
All right, let's Hopefully give this another Hopefully this hill. sounds better. Okay. So let's talk about accessing the actual Linux host. Um, we talked about downloading. Putty is a free download. Um, most, uh, I think people are used to GUI will look at it and say it looks archaic, but uh, it's got some some good features in it. You're able to uh, increase the, the actual size of the font. You're able to change the colors. And yes, it does look like a 1980s terminal, but it makes our life a lot easier and it's very easy to get a hold of. And we know that it's available very easily from the web. So it makes our life simple. Uh, we log in through a secure shell. So SSH, and it's very simple to do. You use SSH, the actual, the username that you're logging in as, and then the IP address to connect. So it's a pretty simple interface and makes life much simpler for us as we're managing. Uh, the do's and don'ts, uh, any of you that have downloaded the Docker image and have worked with it from Microsoft, I will tell you that the actual design of it is very inefficient and it's not the way that we would set up a, uh, a an actual Linux host. It's not effective, it's not uh, secure. Uh, when we start talking about um, logging and doing things as root, most Linux admins will not allow you to do that. They would tell you it's it's just not an option. If you need to do anything, you're going to do it with sudo, which is switch the user to the domain owner and work there. And that it's auditable. They know what's going on. Um, all that's being tracked in the system. Also, root has power, it's God on that host. You know, if you go into a Windows um, machine and you decide to delete files that are hooked to registry connections, which are in a system of that uh, host, it's going to come back and tell you, no, you need administrative privileges. And it's also going to come back many times and tell you, you, you still can't remove things. Where if you go into the very top root directory and you type in rm minus rf, and star, it's going to remove everything. It's going to delete it all. It figures you know what you're doing. So you can do a little bit of damage as root. So it's usually best to start with the least amount of privileges, just as you would on a database. So what we would do is that you would have a unique ID that you would log in as. And the Docker image really should be logged in as an MS SQL login. And then you would have a group, which are just the same as kind of roles, if you look at it that way, and role permissions. And then you would your login to log in and then su over switch user or sudo over if you want to do power as root to do over what you need to do as that that more powerful user and you would perform that task um each user in here has a role hierarchy and you can have multiple groups assigned just like you could have multiple roles assigned to a user each uh user is going to have a profile we also call them um, run commands that are set up to make it easier to do what you need to do. It's kind of a set of uh, commands and uh, your actual uh, aliases and what shell you want to use and other important settings. Um, you're going to see this in, depending on the flavor of Linux, you're going to see it set up as dot bash RC or dot bash underscore RC. You will also see dot profiles, dot profile with an extension as you can see by that last one, saying that it's specific for a certain kind of environment. Um, the reason that we start with dot is that when you do an LS, which is a list, those dot files won't come up and that way you have a cleaner look and also it's sort of a, a viewing um, security option. If you think that it, it protects you from somebody just looking over your shoulder, you protect your files just a little bit. Uh, but you will see always those dot and those uh, those main files that are there. And an example of a profile or an RC file is right here. And the first command, you see the pound slash bang. That says for this first user, you're going to set up the run command to execute their shell. And they're using a standard shell. Uh, the editor equals nano. And that says that they're using that there. And you'll see the next line in there, there's a pound to say it's commented out, but you've also had vi, and so you'll hear vim. These are another edit editor that's there. They uh, are able to switch over the domain owner for vi sudo, tells you what that command is there, and they export the path, which is just like your environment variables within your Windows machine. We also export different variables for our homes, and these are just shortcuts. You can see on the second line past that Oracle home is the SQL home. And that's to say, if you were to say change directory 
to dollar SQL home all in caps because it is cap sensitive, you would automatically be changed over to the slash u01 app MS SQL 140 directory. All you have to type though is dollar SQL home. You don't have to type in that entire path. And as you can see for the Oracle path, that's pretty complicated. So it's kind of nice to not have to remember that and just type in that thing. And you could use that in scripts. You could use it in a host of different areas. We also talk about the Java home here and other apps. You can have that in there along with aliases and aliases just allow us to type in reload and reload, of course, is going to reload as you're seeing your source and the bash profile that's setting the profile, the environment variables run that. Uh, we have an alias for the previews and then we have an alias for changing the directory back to the home there. All of that went up. That's all set up in this um, profile example that you're seeing. Next is to kind of give you a feel of recognizing that um, all commands are not alike and that because Linux was one of the later versions that came out in uh, the Unix flavors that there's a number of complex commands here. Use add and add user may sound very similar, but they do a little bit different things, even though both of them initially create a user. The um, added um, features that go along with that command, the simplicity versus the complexity of each one of them are different. So if you do user add, you would be required to manually update that password with the PASSWD command with the username. Because if you didn't add the username with it, and let's say you were doing this as root, you'd be changed to the password for root. You don't want to do that. You'd have to manually assign the group. You would have to add any pertinent information about that user into the repository. You'd have to do that yourself where if you used add user, it would ask you for all that information and compile as one set of utility commands. Um, so you recognize that a lot of times it's important to know what each of these do. And if you're doing something very, very simple, you have a set of commands if you want to do something more complex or complete, there's another set. As we stated, you should have a user for every single login. Um, share logins, you may have it for an application requires its own login, but unless you're making changes, changes for that application, like updating, patching an app, things like that. Even, you know, for your SQL server, that's what you'd run your SQL server updates as. You don't want to be sharing those logins and logging in as you would log in as yourself and, of course, as you over. Um, your Linux administrator would grant sudo with great care. Most uh, database administrators on the Oracle side have to ask for that grant to be offered to them, and many times they have to go through a risk assessment and then a justification and a sign-off on it. And same thing with SU. To switch user means you become that user. It is an audited function. Your administrator knows about it, but it's important to understand that you are still there. If you're going to do an SU or SU, and you can see the commands here, like the SU minus and then becoming J Smith, you become the user J Smith. And then if you want to sudo over, you can see that I'm when I'm sudoing, it's very different versus becoming a user. Sudo, I'm saying I want to perform this as that god power. I want to pseudo as root. And then I'm running a shell script. And there's an argument after it of minus y for yes. But let's say I don't have rights to do pseudo on this. You would see this error that you're saying here. You know, Aaron Kilk is not in the pseudoers file. This incident will be reported. It means that this is being reported into the audit file. And the administrator will know that this was tried, this was attempted, and it was not allowed. So next is understanding file permissions. Um, most files, of course, you have read, write, and execute, and there's numeral calculations with this. And the main thing to remember about it is that we have the differences between our base 64 and then our data that you're seeing here, the four, the two, the one, as it's um, brought back over. And your read equals fours, write equals two, and execute equals one. And then you have an owner, a group, and an other that assigned to this. So there's three calculations for each one. So you can have a total of seven as the top number for each one of these. That's what it's gonna add up to. So I think that starts to make sense as you start to pull it apart. So you will hear people say, you know, well, the file, what's the permission on the file? And you hear them say 774, 744. This, this is what it's talking about is the permissions on there is the calculations for what it has that would end up equaling up to those permissions. And to do that, we would use the change mod or change modify command. So we do change modify, change mod, the actual file name, and then the three numbers that equal that out. 
So we took this test text file and I wanted to change it. I could do a 764, which would be owner, group, and other. You can see the first one is seven, which is read, write, and execute. Next one is read, write, which is six, and other. I'm only giving read access. So they don't have the group permissions given to them on that file, and they're not the owner. They would only have the ability to read. If they were the group, they could read and write, and if they're the owner, they could do everything, anything they want to that file. They have God powers on it. And you must have the permissions to update these. If you didn't, then you would need to be able to do it as sudo, or you would need to switch over and become the user, one of those two, to be able to make these changes, such as a command like change mod. So let's say you want to become the owner of that file. You would do a change owner, CHO, chow. So we would change owner, the new user, colon, the group, and then the file. So if I wanted to change this over, I would change it over to J Smith. I want to make it the group is DBA and the file is SH. And again, I must have permissions to do that. Otherwise, I could do this as sudo if I have those rights. There's some basic commands that you would use over and over again. And these, there's a lot more than this, of course, but these are the ones that you use the most often. To change a directory is CD, and you can do a CD, CD space dot dot, which will bring you one up. CD will just bring you back to your home directory. CD and the directory path will bring you to wherever you'd like. You can list files, which is an LS. And you'll start to notice some of these commands are the first and the third letter. That's quite common but a list command, ls, and this is one that you will have challenges with because you'll want to run dir because this is one that does not translate over into the Windows world, but ls, ls minus lf, ls minus la, if you want to take all these, you know, take a look at all your files, ls minus ltr to put them in descending order. This is quite common, you know, what was the, the most recent dated file? Uh, this makes life a little bit easier as you start to view things and take a look at things inside the uh, directories. We have commands like find to locate a program. You, excuse me, put in find and then put in the app like Java. You could do find in MSSQL and it will find your secret. And this is going to show you each one of the installations on there that belongs to it versus which, which will tell you which one is actually being used for your profile. Let's say you think you've executed a profile that is using um, SQL Server 2017 and a new release has come out and you've installed that as well on your Linux box. And you think you're on the one, but the newest one is actually the environment variable that's active. It would tell you that if you put which and then MS SQL, it would show you. Next command is PWD. That is your current directory. If you type in PWD, it'll tell you exactly where you are in the hierarchy of the, the file structure. And that one comes in handy a lot of times as you're you know, kind of tromping around within directories and not realize where you're at. You need to quickly type in a PWD and it'll kind of orient you and let you know where you are. Next is make dir. And make dir is interesting because you will create directories very often as you're building out an environment like make dir scripts, wherever you are, or make dir and then write out the full path if you're not already there. The interesting thing is as you see this arrow coming up from remove, you can remove a file names, but if you need to remove a directory, you can only do an rm dir if the directory is empty. If it's not, then you would have to remove it such as you would like a file with a force, an rm minus what's called an f, rm minus f with the directory name. And then to go to that next line, we're on to the create file. Uh, we often touch files. To touch a file creates an empty file. So you can do touch um, test.sh and you've created an empty shell file. You can do touch test.txt, you've created an empty text file. The extensions don't mean so much in there as you do for Windows. We, of course, want to identify our files that make sense. But keep in mind that you can create an empty file and not have anything in it that really describes what it is. We also edit files, and I'm going to go through Vim and Vi for you. Um, Vi is pretty much old school. You'll hear people talk about Emacs and Nano. Um, when you say you use Vi or Vi, you'll hear it said both ways. Uh, it kind of says that you're, you know what you're doing. Um, it gives you cred on the Linux side and the Unix side because it's comebacks for so long. I learned on Vi. Um, I've done all my scripting mostly with Corn and Bash. And uh, to be able to do this just kind of gives you a little bit more life. 
Um, it tells them that you've been working with it a little longer and it may be a little misleading. Some people may say, but I don't think it hurts because I appreciate by the ability to not have to leave my fingers from the keyboard and edit files. So I will go over that with you here in a little bit too. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the PS command. Um, PS is for processes and often you will type in a PS minus EF. And you're going to see something just like this on the right here, where it says PS minus EF. And it shows you each one of the processes that are running. And the first one on there, the PID1, which is your process ID number, is your SQL Server. That's your actual executable that's running. The next two, and you will notice the parent PID PPID, it says zero. That means that it's right up there to the root. The uh, next one down, you see five, and then you see the parent ID is one. So after, after the SQL Server executable, you have the actual SQL Server um, uh, multi-threaded processes that are running. Now, what's interesting about SQL Server versus Oracle, and I'm hoping that it will change in the future, I'm unsure that it will, is that with Oracle, it's not a multi-threaded process. What we're actually seeing is that there is a separate PID for every one of the areas of memory. The, um, the M-MON, the L-MON, the S-MON, each one of these, the system monitors, your session monitor, the um, process monitor, each one of them can be managed separately. They could be killed separately. Um, outside of S-MON and P-MON, most of these will restart on their own. So let's say you had a memory leak in just one of them. You could not only trace it and isolate it on its own, you could also kill it and have it restart. Uh, this is kind of nice, and unfortunately, this isn't something that's built into SQL Server at this point in Linux, but it's also in its infancy. So we'll wait and we'll see. But you can also notice how these uh, go from the child process, the main PID, from the parent um, as they, they thread up. So you see the PPID, you got 015 versus the actual process ID of 15 and 7. From there, you can see some bash. Um, uh, processes that are running from the root, and they've got a secondary PID that you're seeing there for 14.735 and 21.897. You can also see that I have SU'd over to J. Smith. So you can see the parent was the root user at 21.897. That became, I SU'd over to J. Smith, so he has his own process of 23.791. And you can also see the process that ran my PS minus. All of that is captured. We can also kill a process using the kill command. So I can say kill, choose a PID, and kill it. If I do kill five, it would actually bring down your SQL Server environment. Same thing with kill one. If there's something very, very wrong and you needed to kill it and it was not going down gracefully, you could do what's called the kill minus nine. And this is something that most DBAs know quite Quite clearly, if they have an Oracle database that just refuses to come down, there's something that's tied it up. A kill minus nine on the PMON or the SMON will bring it down quite ungracefully. It is pretty much an abort on it. So keep in mind that there are ways to kill your system and bring it down quite hard. So here's where you get into the editors. As I said, by Vim, this kind of makes you cool, gives you cred, it's old school. You'll hear about Nano, Emacs, there's tons, tons of editors. But in a pinch, you've always got Vi pretty much on any Linux server you go on. And you will just learn to Vi view files, which also will allow you to override and edit if you want. Um, those will always be installed on there. You can create a file, as I said, with the touch command. So you can touch and put in the file name and create it empty if you want, even for a placeholder. Or if you want to test, do I have write commands? Um, or, or write capabilities on this, this directory. You could do a touch. If you're able to touch a file there, that means, yes, you can do that. So if you want to learn Vi, there are tons, tons of commands on this. But to keep in mind, I mean, you can do a very complex replace throughout this. I mean, it is awesome. But if you want to do this, the first thing you want to, you want to open it up is you'll do Vi or view, which will view the file. Um, the, you do Vi and then your file name. And you can also do this with a new file name. It will create a brand new file. And to go down, once you open it up, you can do a J. If you want to go up a line, it's K. To the right, L, H. And you'll start to notice it's also the same direction on the keyboard from each other. Mostly with that right hand. I will be an insert. A is append. If you do capital A, it'll append at the end of the line. And unfortunately, it didn't capitalize there at the end, I see. 
Um, you can add a line or insert below the line with an O. Um, if you do capital O, shift O, it'll add a line above it. You can undo with a U, quit with Q. Now this is where it gets interesting. Let's say you did type in view file name instead. And most DBAs like to do view first for the simple reason that, let's say you make a mistake and you're able to just quit out and you don't have to worry about saving. And many times you may just be viewing a file and you find something wrong in it and then you want to edit it. The nice thing is, is you have that safety that if you accidentally type in the keyboard, you're not going to impact that file. But if you need to, then you can do what's called an override. And that's where you notice quit without saving colon Q versus quit without saving to a read-only file is colon Q bang. And this is to override it, that bang or that exclamation point does that. If you were buying the file, you could write to it with a colon W, or I could say I want to overwrite and also quit. I could do colon W Q bang to a read-only file. So this is something that you can play around with, create your own little text files and start editing and play around with Vi, but it is awesome. And you'll find as you start to learn how to do it, it's automatic. Um, I have found even my Raspberry Pis, I needed to have Vi. I was very, very uncomfortable with Nano and you just get used to being able to do everything you need from the actual keyboard. If you want to redirect, let's say you need to take from one file and bring it to another or there's a command that comes up with a huge list of files or directories and you need to be able to just kind of parse through it and look there's a couple different ways to do this but one would be to save it up to a file this is also how we log things um, we could do like a list of the files that are in a directory and then do a carry so one redirect and say bring it to file list.txt i could do an ls and do two carrots and file list.txt, and that means I'm appending. That means I will continue to write to that file versus overwriting that file. If I did it again and just had a single redirect, it would rewrite over that file brand new. It would erase what was there existing. So keep in mind those are the differences in there, but we use this very often for logging. We will uh, pull data out of one file. We call it grepping, and I'll talk about that a little bit, and uh, pull it into a log file, and then we'll parse through and see if there's any issues in it, and we'll report upon it. So this is a really easy way of taking data and write it to a scary file. Running updates on Linux are pretty easy. Um, when you're into a server, and most often you're going to hear yum or apt-get. There's also zipper. Uh, zipper is a little bit different. But uh, for apt-get and yum, they look very, very similar. And apt-get is the most common one. And apt-get, you would first update the repository with apt-get update. And then you would want to install those updates. And they may require sudo if not in there as root, of course. And you would do apt-get install. And that will install all the required security patches and everything to the OS that need to be installed. If from that point you want to install a certain package, that means a utility or anything else, after you've done that repository update because you want the latest version that's available, you would go in and do sudo apt get install. And if there was an argument, many times it says, "Do you are you sure you want to install it? That's why we have the minus Y there. And the package, you can also view packages information on them with the apt cache command. And I can do an apt cache the package name and you have apt cache show and you do the package name it'll show you the information about that package before you install it or after you install it to give you more information about it if you're interested in learning a little bit about these i have the cheat sheets for yum apt get as well as zipper so don't feel like you you're, you're going god i wish i knew more about this i need to take care of mine all of it's there you're going to find like i said the yum and apt get are very similar zipper is a little bit and um, these cheat sheets will really benefit you as you're moving forward. And the first thing you're going to find out is as you're starting to work with packages, Google is your friend. Uh, many, pack, any, many utilities are in different packages and their names are very different than what the utility is. And you go on Google and say apt get and then put in that, that actual utility name and it'll tell you what that package was that it belongs to. So keep in mind, Google's your friend on this. Next, we'll talk a little bit about PowerShell. Um, I personally didn't feel that uh, Linux would really sell to most of the Windows administrators. 
without having PowerShell. And they now have a base for it, which is wonderful. But also consider learning, um, you know, Bash, K-Shell. Uh, these are very, very similar. C-Shell, you don't see this as much, but Bash and K-Shell are definitely two that you need to consider. The shell scripting is, there's a lot of different ways of writing these shell scripts. I had an excellent K-Shell instructor and uh, you know it's you know you start out very differently than you do in PowerShell, but you're setting your environment variables. You know you're writing your actual code, and then you execute it at the end, and that is pretty much the same. And uh, learning K shell is important because that's what most of these updates are going to come from. Uh, these people came from the, the Linux world versus the PowerShell world. But it's worthwhile this time to learn this and to recognize that as DevOps takes over, most of this will kind of disappear. No matter what you're writing in, the GUI will take care of it and translate it and make it consumable for the Linux host. So let's talk a little bit about system level diagnostics. Once you get on the machine, you need to be able to get around it and know what's going on in it. And there's a number of them. Uh, that should be an underline. That's a little bit up on the screen here. We've got a number of different ones, but the most basic one that's on every machine is top. VM stat, MP stat, you see pretty often, and then SAR and SADC and SADF. As you're running in these arguments, one of the things to remember is that um, if they're not installed, if you have access to it, you can install it, or you can ask your administrator to install it. Um, you can do, if you have to do a sudo on that, you're going to have to know the packet name and you would install it. And then when you're running the actual utilities, it's almost universal that you can do commands with these. So you can do a help, which is, as you see in the bottom there, the command minus H or minus help that will tell you what options are there available for them. It'll be the command and minus X for your actual um, argument. And you can do more than one together. So one minus and then whatever number of arguments you want to put in there to get the uh, results that you're looking for. You can also do a, an argument and then you can put seconds behind it that you want it to sleep and how many times you want it to return. So you have those that will return on a regular basis and just keep returning. Let's say you go, you know what, I don't want it the default that it's once every three seconds. So I want it once every five seconds. I want it to return five times. So as you see in that third one down, we would type in the command minus whatever argument we're looking for and say return it every five seconds, return it five times. So here's one of them is SAR, and we would install this. This is part of the sysstat package. And we install it using yum minus y install sysstat or app minus get install sysstat. You can see how common those are, how close they are. Um, that's the nice thing about yum and app get is they are very similar. And the SAR utility, um, the way that you can do this is like we want to use uh, CPU utilization. We would just type in SAR minus u. It'll give us very clear information about what's being used, what the system is using, how much is idle. It gives us kind of an average, a nice average on it. Uh, we can look at the intervals of the CPU. We would do SAR, one and three. So it would show us three times and it give us one second intervals on it. We can do the run queue information on that report. It would be SAR minus Q. And it would give us the run queue size. It would give us the process list, the sizes and the load averages. We could do the context switching activity with the SAR minus W. Do virtual memory swapping, which SAR minus W. Notice those differences between there. Minus W in the capital sensitivity there. So minus W small versus a minus W large. Those are two different things. And that'll be extremely crucial for you to remember that capitalization is important in Linux. We also can look at virtual memory paging with a SAR minus B. It'll tell us the pages in and the pages out. Here's one here where I'm looking at the CPU usage of SAR minus U with five second intervals and five times return. And this would actually update five times what you're seeing here. And this is how this report comes out nice and neat. And as you can see, I just copied and pasted it into the screen here, but it tells me how much is idle, um, if there's any um, weights, what the system is, the averages, along with the user percentage as well. And I've done it against all the CPUs, but I can actually even list which CPU that I want to look at if there's just one CPU that seems heavily used over another. Here I've got SAR minus Q. I can look at the run queue on this one. And you can see the run queue size, the process list, um, the load averages, and it, it gives it to me in kind of um, an aggregated format. So I can see it at one second, five seconds, 15 seconds, and I 
and see what kind of trends are going on in the system. Next is SADC and SADF. This is the background activity and it's a data collector behind it. It's pretty cool. Um, there's all the data is coming in in uh, binary files and you can actually pull this out with something we call awk, which is a command on the Linux system. You can pull it into Excel and the output is all in the XML files. We've also got utilities like MPStat. The nice thing about MPStat is that you can grab the actual CPU data. You can pull it into like here with Excel and create nice uh, screenshots that are going to give your uh, company a little bit more information about what's going on in the resources here and work with it. I think that makes a really big deal for most companies because as much as we like the data, many times a picture will provide a lot more information on how to work with it. MP stat, this is what it looks like on the output before I've actually ran it into a uh, graph that you see, or a uh, output of, um, that you saw with Excel. So I can grab different pieces of it here, but notice that I've done this with MP stat minus P all, and it shows me across the average for all of them. Then it breaks the CPU down by zero and one so I can see the individual CPUs on this system that has two. And also look at virtual memory statistics. And then here's the most common, which is top. Uh, top gives you a first across the board approach with the information about how much CPU, the memory, the swap, the information that you need to know. Then it goes into the processes from the top to the least usage. It usually shows about 20 on the screen. And the nice thing about it is that it starts to refresh. It's on a five second interval. And as this one, you can see here, you can see the top SQL Server processes with it. And then some of the background processes. One is a kernel thread process, and these ones here belong to the actual um, Linux machine. But I can see how long they've been running and then the resources that they're, they're utilizing. Next is uptime. Um, for a Linux system, this isn't something we see as often because they're rarely going to be um, cycled. But you will see one five minute and 15 minute load averages on it. It'll give you all this information, it looks like this. So you can see the uptime is 41 days, 17 minutes on my little Docker image I had there. It tells me what one user is logged in and it tells me my load averages, one, five, 15. I also can use the W and the W is kind of neat because this tells me about not only about what's going on in the system, but what users are logged in. So you can see on this one here, my Delphix user is the only one logged in. When they actually logged in, are they idle, are they active and how much CPU usage they're doing. It also tells me what they're doing. So this one here is using secure shell and it's logged. Next, we'll talk about some process diagnostics. Um, so your PS is your process status. We talked about this. Next is PMAP. It's not as valuable, I think, for um, SQL Server, and I've gone into it a little bit because of multi-threading. I've done a, um, a blog post that goes into multi-threading and how you would go back from the PMAP processes into um, the actual sys dot processes on the system, so you can see that. So keep that in mind. There is a way to track this all back and see the multi-threaded system inside the SQL Server. So I do have a blog post on this if you're interested in digging into it deeper. I know that we'll be out of time before we could ever get into that. But also talk about DSTAT, which is Disk CPU and Network Monitoring, and then on NMON, which is kind of nice because it's a little color-coded, and as you're getting used to it, it'll help you out. I'm going to go into that more in the next session as well that I do. As we talked about top, um, the nice thing about it is, is once you start it, you need to be able to get out of it. Always remember that control C and quit are your friends, so Q. These will get you out of a lot of these that have intervals that continue to run. So remember that as you go through. And the top utilities we talked about looks like this. PS utility is the ones that we go and actually look at the process data because you need to know what is running. And even though your command prompt may change, you know the dollar sign, percent, pound, you're looking at like PS minus EAF for your running process, PS minus EUX. So you can look at your different processes that are going from um, the status for the, the PID and the PPID, your um, recent CPU usage and the PS minus EO and your options. You can hit the uh, help file, the PS minus H, and it will tell you different ways of collecting information for process. And again, this is something I go into with the advanced tools on this too. But you can see this one here. One thing to remember is that you can also use the pipe command. You can see the pipe 
between these commands here. So I did a PS minus EF and I decided to sort it by the actual number, the process number, and then I asked it to tail. And it's giving me just the tail end of these. And you can see that each one of these root processes, um, the actual pits for them, when they logged in, and what's going on behind them. So you see one is uh, writing data to one of the drives and you're seeing different backgrounds and flushing um, kernel processes. All of this is what you can actually pull with some of these different commands. But with the PS utility, I've created almost my own version of top. I'm going to see this and it's going to keep tailing. It'll update on a regular basis for me and I can monitor this as it goes along. You can do this different ways. This is command here is doing something very similar. PS minus EO, it gives me the user information. I've asked for the PID. I've asked for the CPU usage, um, the actual very, um, the, the size on the array um, and the communication information. Again, tail it and just keep giving this information to me. So keep in mind, there's different ways that we run different commands to answer very distinct questions for the problems that we're facing. I can also go out here and do a PS minus EF, and then I've piped and grep for jar. So what I'm looking for is my Java commands on this one, jar, of course, Java. And it tells me very quickly that I have a process with the PID 11313, and it's coming from my Apache Tomcat, and I can see this here. I can then do a PS minus EWW on 11313, and an EWW tells me a little bit more about those individual users that are that individual process. It tells me what, sh what it's using for its shell. It tells me where the terminal is coming from, the user, the path that it's utilizing. The password, if it was in plain text, would be displayed. So this gives you a little bit of security information. You can see how you might want to monitor this. Um, tells me the home directory, the shell, that it, the shell level it's using, the log name, all of this information is here, even which Java it's using, which is executable. So you can see how all this information is available for us by just changing the way that we have put the arguments in for the command or adding with a pipe a separate command to distinctly enter into that information. Next base is CPU and PMAP and CPU diagnostics. Um, PMAP, like I said, isn't as valuable for someone on the SQL Server side, but I wanted you to at least see it. Again, using our 1113, which was our Java process, you can see I do a PMAP minus X 11313. What this does is this breaks down that entire process, that PID, by every single memory, every piece of memory, every piece of resource that it's using, and it shows me what each these are. If you have ever had one uh, one process that's utilizing a ton of memory and you've had to turn it over to support and find out where there was actually a memory leak or anything like that, this is really cool because this will show you every single library, which is, think of it like DLLs. So you, you see those SO files, they're kind of like DLLs on this side. The JAR files, with the Java files, the executables, any of the kernel level um, the stack, all of that shown, displayed by each one of the kilobytes for the memory, if there's any dirty reads that are involved, along with the totals at the bottom. And I could turn this over to a support person, and that would give them a lot of definitive information that most um, utilities would take a lot more work to do. And this is a simple process, a simple execution that I've done at the command line. I'm going to skip over F user and LSOF because I'm going to go through that in my next session. And I know that we are going to be running out of time soon. And this is something that can wait. Um, DSTAT is one that you can get here and you can get disk information from this. And same thing, we already went through this one, so I'm going to skip this one here. Next is Find Mount. Um, I really like Find Mount. Um, this is a separate package that can be installed. You can see I've got the yum install here. And I've also got the app get installed, very, very similar on it. But what's nice about it is it gives you the hierarchy of the actual file system. So you not only am seeing where you're coming from root, what everything trails down to. So you can find your, your directories very, very quickly and see what's in each one. And it'll also tell you what options are there, what access you have, do you read, write, and um, what kind of file type it is too. Because this one was actually done on a Docker image. You're going to see a little bit oddity in the directories versus if you're in a full you know, server versus a virtualized environment. But you can see the differences, the actual sources, where the directory is, what kind of file type it is, and again, the, the, uh, the options that you have to work with it. You can also do a file mount minus M, and it's going to tell you a little bit specific group information, excuse me, who has access to it, 
It's going to tell you what users have access to it and what the, um, the uh, procedures are for that. So you can see the block IO information will tell you this one's for memory for information for doc or the CPU account information. All of it just gives you a little bit more data about everything that's going on. And of course, this provides you answers. Next is NCDU. Um, this is another quick utility to allow you to be monitoring a system and uh, also tells you the actual space usage for it. So if I do an NCDU on any directory, it's going to show me every one of the files. Now, the directory that you have here is actually an Oracle database, but it really displays quickly about what the space usage is. And then it shows me by largest to smallest the amount of, of data in there. And it gives me a little bit of a visual ticker on there, showing me the largest file down to the least. So what do we have here? Um, best thing to do is to learn to walk before run. Um, command line is essential with Linux. It's one thing that you'll be working back from very, very clearly. There are GUIs for Linux that you can utilize, but being able to do everything in the command line as well as a GUI will serve you well in the future and is something that you should do. Utilities are your friends. Um, most of the time, because the utilities are kernel friendly, they're very light, there's no heavy footprint on them. And you can ask your administrator to install them or you can install them yourselves if you have the privileges and find one that really provides you the best information that you become comfortable with. Um, so really think about what you're gonna install when you do it. Uh, you can build knowledge, you know, with these command line editing tools like Vi, Nano, um, shell scripting will benefit you. So definitely bring it out and learn, I recommend Bash, that's what most people are going to. I'm a K-Shell person myself, but I had to learn Bash as well. And now I have to learn PowerShell. So it's it's important to kind of learn shell programs and Python, of course, too. I'm recommending to people. And it may seem tough at first, but you'll get the hang of it. And you'll find it's got a lot of comfort for you. And you will start to just do it naturally. And if you're ready to get started, please consider using, your, of course, your Microsoft Azure account. And if you don't want those charges and you want to do something just simple on your desktop, Docker, the image for there, it's really easy to use. If you've got a window, Windows machine, install Docker and get the, uh, the actual Docker image from there. I can set one up in about three to five minutes. And uh, if you have VMware or VirtualBox, of course, there's Linux images for that. And you can just have it on your PC. The Docker image is going to use less utilities or less resource usage. So if you've got a little bit less on the memory on your PC, look at the Docker image first. And with that, Andy, I am finished with a couple minutes to spare. Fantastic. So if you just want to jump over to the next question slide, do we happen to have any uh, questions as of right now? There are none in the queue. I'll give uh, folks a minute to type uh, type on into the questions pane if you guys happen to have anything. One question, will you be covering man pages in the next session? Yeah, I don't. Um, I will tell you, man pages have kind of disappeared. It's the, the help. I'd be very happy. Is there any specific question you're looking for? Um, man pages, you can still look up online, but with Linux, you're using the minus H and the minus help to give you more information about each one of the packages or utilities that you're looking for. And the follow up to that is no specific question. Wasn't sure if they were still a thing or not. Another question. It's the minus H and the minus help. Yep. Right on. Uh, another question. Will you cover performance in the next, uh, in the advanced session? Yes, I will. I tried to keep all the performance utilities to that session. Um, Try to remember all that I'm going through, but they, there's a ton of it. Uh, the performance session is the same one that I've done at Hot Sauce, and it was a deep performance session for the Linux folks. I'm going to do tracing. I'm going to go through performance tools. I'm going to go through um, monitoring um, at a deeper level. Uh, so yes, if that's what you're looking for, that's what I'm going to be going over. Excellent. I actually uh, misunderstood that question. Apparently there's a utility called perf as well. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to be covering that as well? Yeah, in the advanced session? Excellent. I know perf is in there too. Yes. Excellent. All right. Another question. Uh, are the MS uh, SQL binaries able to be in a different directory besides opt MS SQL? Oh, absolutely. Um, your choice to install it, you can pretty much install anything anywhere you want. 
Um, I have it on one of my Delphix machines and I just created a directory and did the installation. Yeah, it's, it, it's up to you. I have worked in many Linux shops where, you know, you're looking, to, we always say, oh, well, Oracle's going to be in U01. It, no, it could be anywhere. It's in VAR opt. It could be all over the place. But yeah, SQL Server works the same way. All right. Another question. Do you recommend staying away from Docker on Red Hat? Docker on Red Hat. I haven't had any issues with it. Um, I know a lot of people, they're going to tell you that Docker with SQL Server in production is not an option. They're going to tell you that that's not the best thing to do. The performance is pretty weak on it. I love Docker for learning. I love Docker for development if you're not doing any kind of performance um, testing on it. So that would be my answer there. I've never heard anyone say Docker and not have it on Red Hat. Um, okay. I, I just never heard that at all. All right. I had another question come on in. Can I use Windows authentication for SQL Server on Linux? Uh, they're working on that right now. I don't think it's out yet. It was pretty close, but I don't think it's out yet. And they're, they're using LDAP. Fantastic. Any more questions uh, from the audience? I believe that I've caught up on the queue. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, when will services be supported? Good question. I have not seen that answer at all, and I haven't seen much on that topic. Hopefully, I'll, I'd be happy to throw it out on Twitter and see if anybody else has heard that one. Excellent. So if you're not following me on Twitter, just let me. I'm the noisy DBA Kevlar. I'm pretty loud out there. <laughs> All right. Last chance for questions. We got about another two minutes left. Ah, my Linux admins are very strict with sudo. Are there any workarounds for running MSSQL operating system commands? So you're saying MSSQL is being owned by the root user. Please answer that first. Waiting for Any a response here. on that one. Yeah, that's I'm going to assume that um, if your your SQL server is being is owned by the root user, that's your first problem right there. It needs to be running as an MS SQL user, and then you need to have a um, MS SQL install group um, separate from that. That's how it should be set up. It shouldn't be running as root. Um, this is kind of a challenge because we're seeing this same thing with MySQL, MySQL as well. They run it as root, and I don't believe in this. I've always, even when I worked on uh, SQL Server Windows, I demanded to have a SQL Server user on the OS side. It wasn't a domain user, it was a user to run the actual executables. And this is how it should be in Linux. So if it is run by that, please consider having them set it up. If you are in a multi-platform environment, they should have another database platform that they can kind of look at the login, just like their Oracle login and their Aura install. It should be set up if that helps. If not, we can work from there. Sure. My suggestion to the original uh, questioner uh, for that one to uh, reach out to Kellen offline since we only have about 30 seconds or so left before we need to move on to the next session. Uh, there is one final comment that I do wish to share that was put in here is uh, someone had arrived late but was kind of asking and stating that uh, about the watch command or the screen command. Apparently they're super handy as well. And wanted to find out did yes. you cover those. Um. What was the second one? I didn't hear the last. Screen. Watch and screen. screen. Um, I love those. Those are good ideas that I should add that to these sessions. Yes. And the reason we would use these is um, especially screen. Let's say that you have a remote session, a putty session, and there's a network hiccup and you lose connectivity and you were running a script. A screen would allow you to reconnect in and it's still running in the background. Very, very powerful. Very important. So, yes, I didn't cover it. But yes, it should be it should be in the session, and I'm going to add it. I'll add it in the future. Awesome. How's that? 
final ones. Yeah, I agree. Sounds fantastic. All right, with that, uh, our time is up. So please stay tuned and go jump over to our next session, Pods, Containers, and SQL Server, uh, What You Need to Know with Joey D'Antoni. Thank you once again for uh, joining us, and I uh, hope you all have a fantastic